BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And just a quick reminder every Monday is Zodiac Mondays. Wednesday is an Ask Me Anything. That's an AMA, so please drop your questions below for things that you would like discussed here on the show. And Friday is an Anything Goes. Any subject is fair game, mostly talking about true crime, serial killers, the Zodiac Killer, but any subject is welcome. All right, so please share some ideas in the comment section about what you would like to hear about on this channel, and let's get started. All right, hello everybody. Today is Monday, another Zodiac Monday. Welcome to the show. And last week on the channel, I did a Zodiac AMA about the suspect Gary Francis Post, and I thought that went really well. But also, I started out the episode by talking about the Gary Post questions and comments, and then it just went into a general discussion about the Zodiac Killer, and I would like to do that same thing here in this episode, starting with the questions and comments about the Zodiac Killer suspect McDuff, and then there will be a few more just general Zodiac comments that I'll respond to at the end of the episode. But before we begin, I would like to remind you guys that I am also the host of the program Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube. It is a channel, actually, different channel, but it is the home of the podcast for sleep. Some people were saying that they use this program, Black Box Online Radio, as a way to fall asleep at night, and I thought, why not create something specifically customized to help people fall asleep? And you can find that on Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube, as well as some other videos about psychology, astrology, personality traits, and just life experiences in general. All of that is on Astro Psych 400. Please like and subscribe, as well as this channel, of course, BBOR. And a great way to support both of these shows is to go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel murder mystery inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise, and remember, being weird is not a crime. And back when I first started doing some AMAs on the channel Ask Me Anythings, I would begin with a borrowed question that didn't come from the YouTube comments section, and it is one that gets asked a lot during the Olympic times. To anyone who's listening to these regularly as they come out, the Winter Olympics have just started, in China, and they often ask a question to the people watching and the audience, and that is, who is the greatest Olympian of all time? And it's a very difficult question to ask, because of course we have the Summer Olympics and the Winter Olympics, and with the Summer Olympics, some people are just like Michael Phelps, he won all of those medals right, but then they're saying very clearly that, well, not every athlete gets to compete in as many events as the swimmer Michael Phelps did. For example, Usain Bolt, the track star, was someone who won 10 straight gold medals. Like, his first 10 medals were all golds. He actually broke the record that was sent by the uh, standing jumper Ray Uri back in the early 1900s, who won nine straight gold medals. And it's not only nine straight, but also having gold medals and only gold medals, so not everyone gets to compete in as many events as a swimmer, and some people say flat out, if you're going to talk partnerships, Misty May Trainer and Kerry Walsh, because they went through three Olympics, undefeated, not only did they not lose any games, they never lost a set in beach volleyball, but that's a partnership, and what about older athletes like Balbir Singh Sr., who took India to three field hockey gold medals in consecutive Olympics, and that is also being a team leader as well as a team player as well as just an Olympian. It's a very difficult question to ask, but if you're going to look at the Winter Games, which is what I think they were focusing on, I think that there's a very strong case that Klaus Heisler is perhaps the greatest Winter Olympian of all time in ski jumping, but there's another condition, there's another problem, is that he didn't get to compete in his uh, final game. And some people think there's this wacky conspiracy against him that the CIA took him out because 
he was going to compete for East Germany, and they didn't want him to win the gold for East Germany. And then there's also this alternative theory that he simply just relocated to America and ended up living out his days in Virginia. But um, I don't know. Uh, just I said he was the best because he had really uh, revolutionized a ski jumping technique to go uh, farther than anyone had ever done before. But we will never really uh, see how that one truly would have went down. Now to get on to the Zodiac questions and comments, we first had one from Brad. And this one was sent in to the Facebook page. There's a Facebook page for Black Box Online Radio, and you can also get my personal Facebook, which is in the description box. You can also write the show at blackboxonlineradio at aol.com. And of course, blackboxnid88 on Instagram. Lots of ways to keep in touch. And the question is, what do you think of these three suspects? McDuff, Gary Post, and Hal Snook. Good three-part question. I did an episode on Gary Post last week, so I'll just give a very simple response. And uh, to be fair, Brad's question came in before last week's episode. But a very short response is, Gary Post is a suspect that was brought forward by the Case Breakers, as well as a researcher named Dale Julen, who has a book coming out soon on his Zodiac suspect, Gary Francis Post, a house painter from California. And I personally think that the case breakers are most likely a bunch of frauds, scam artists, and they aren't even putting a good attempt into their con job. I have at least three episodes talking about Gary Post, so I will save that material for those episodes there and invite anyone to listen to those. Hal Snook is an unconventional suspect, and he is the suspect in the orchestration of the hoax theory. I don't think he has ever been accused of committing all of the murders, and the hoax theory was created by Thomas Henry Horan, or it's his observations rather than a creation. He is the author of The Myth of the Zodiac Killer, and is a very unconventional suspect because he mostly accuses Hal Snook of writing the letters, taking credit for murders that he didn't commit. For a while, he was also accusing Hal Snook as being the suspect in the Stein murder, murdering Paul Stein on October 11th of 1969, the final confirmed killing of the Zodiac. But I, he has since backtracked from that, and it's been more than a year now, but Thomas Horn has been talking about a new suspect in the Stein murder, whom I haven't heard about yet, but... He says that one day he will reveal who actually committed the Stein murder. I don't know who that is. But there's another um, researcher out there named Evan from Texas who has a couple YouTube videos, and he very much believes that Hal Snook was the letter writer, but not the actual murderer. Again, hoax theory, someone writing letters taking credit for murders that he didn't commit, and he strongly stands by the claim that um, Hal Snook is the suspect for writing the letters, not murdering Paul Stein, or not being part of a larger murderous conspiracy theory. And I think that's what Evan told me uh, privately, that he just has two major claims, that he believes the letters were a hoax, meaning someone wrote letters taking credit for crimes he didn't commit, and that Hal Snook was a good suspect in orchestrating that hoax. But you can get his videos on the channel Evan from Texas. And now to the man of the hour, Suspect McDuff. I think that Macduff is one that I didn't think too highly of when he was first revealed. Macduff became a suspect in 2021 after some discoveries that were made by Mike Morford of Zodiac Killer's site, also ZodiacKiller.net, as it's currently known as. And as I understand this, and people can correct me if I misspeak or misstate anything, that Mike Morford tried in a new way of examining the evidence, and he located the phone that was used to make a phone call after the Blue Rock Springs shooting. The Blue, the Blue Rock Springs shooting occurred on July 4th of 1969, where the Zodiac Killer shot Darlene Farron and Mike Majot. Darlene Farron died, and Mike Majot survived. And that occurred at, I'm going to guess, 11.55 p.m. on July 4th of 1969. And then at 12.10 a.m., people had found... Mike Majot and Darlene Farron already, and they made a phone call to the authorities saying that there's this um, this uh, shooting and these people need help. Darlene Farron was taken to the hospital and pronounced dead at 12.38 a.m., and the phone call came in at 12.40 a.m. Now, did the person who committed the shooting know that Darlene Farron was pronounced dead at 12.38? 
I've always thought that that was just purely a coincidence. Some people think that uh, the suspect must have been right near the emergency room, but I don't, I don't really know if that's true. Well, what Mike Morford did was he located the payphone where the um, call was made, and then he began to look at houses in the surrounding area in that neighborhood, and he found a suspect that matched a lot of the witness descriptions, that person McDuff, and McDuff is his middle name, but he found someone who resembled the composite sketches after the Stein shooting. He also had a reasonable height and weight for the Zodiac um, killer, being five foot eight and around 200 pounds. He would have been 23 years old at the time, which is consistent with some of the descriptions. Others, not so much. I mean, it's it really is um, something that hasn't been purely established, and it is an unsolved case. So, at first, I thought that I wasn't too blown away by the fact because I didn't see a very large use of methodology. I was like, well, did he just locate the Blue Rock Springs payphone and then find the first person who lived nearby wearing a pair of dark-rimmed glasses who was a young male? I mean, what what else it really was there? And as I said, he does meet some of the other biometrics, and McDuff was educated. He went to Chico State, had a bachelor's degree in sociology. But I appeared on the show um, Planet X Filmworks, the YouTube channel Planet X Filmworks, with Mike Morford and Ross, the host of that one last year, and we were talking about this, and Morph is very passionate about McDuff being the Zodiac Killer, and he was persuading me a little bit more, and I've definitely eased up on some of the claims that I have made, particularly the claims of dismissal against McDuff. I by no means can say that McDuff was the Zodiac Killer. I just see that Morph has put in a lot more thought than I gave him credit for in the past. But also, there is just um, the disclaimer that Morph uh, shared something with me on the Zodiac Killer channel about why we're calling him McDuff, and McDuff is his middle name, and Morph said that that was his own doing. Nobody asked him to do that. He just decided not to reveal the suspect's full name, but I heard him say that on an episode of Zodiac Speaking when he interviewed Joanne Getchy, who was a friend of Donna Lass, and he just referred to him as Mac Andrew, and I guess we can start calling him that. As, as I understand, he was commonly known as Mac and by his middle name. His first name was William, but uh, there are lots of people online already sharing his real name, and for a while he was known as Suspect Mason, and I was hoping that was going to catch on. I thought that was a much cooler name than Suspect Macduff, but not everything is a popularity contest. Our next comment is from Lost Canyon, who says, I'm really surprised at how certain Morph seems about Mac. 95% was his own estimate of certainty about the suspect. He has mentioned elsewhere, either on his podcast or a discussion forum, that there is more information he isn't sharing because law enforcement is looking into Mac, apparently. There must be much more to Mac because all that I've heard so far doesn't convince me at all. Now, Morph did share one thing with me that I have to absolutely keep off the record, and, yeah, there is more, but... Again, I have not exactly seen that type of smoking gun or that type of evidence that really just makes me think, oh my goodness, this has to be the guy. And one reason why I said I did not think that McDuff was the Zodiac Killer in the past was the inconsistencies about witness descriptions involving the Zodiac Killer's height. And I have discussed this with Morph on the um, uh, Zodiac Killer interviews with the Experts series talking about why I thought five foot eight McDuff's height was almost too short to be the Zodiac Killer. To be very clear, I think the Zodiac Killer was between five foot eight and six feet tall. But when I did an episode talking about creating my own profile of the Zodiac, I thought if I had to put an exact estimate on the Zodiac Killer's height, I would have said five foot ten and a half. Because you have the description after the Blue Rock Spring shooting, as well as one description from the Stein shooting, of a five foot eight perpetrator. Then you have the sighting from Officer Falk saying that the Zodiac was five foot ten, and then at Lake Berryessa, from Cecilia Shepard, she estimated that the Zodiac was six feet tall. Or 
two inches taller than someone who was five foot ten, so meaning six feet tall. Oh, so how do you reconcile all of this? And I was simply saying that go for the median, five foot ten or five foot ten and a half. And there are reasons why the perpetrator might seem taller at Lake Berryessa because he was wearing the hooded costume. He would could have been standing on uneven ground, but particularly the hood plus the hood resting on top of whatever haircut he had that would have um, altered the suspect's height. So that's how I reconciled all of it. And it doesn't mean that a five foot eight suspect is too short. Maybe a five seven, five six, five five suspect. And there are suspects who are five feet six inches tall, and I think they're absolutely not the Zodiac Killer because they're too short. McDuff is very borderline. There's another reason why I brought up our appearance on Planet X Filmworks, and that is because Morph was also disputing the sighting by Officer Falk of the Zodiac. And it was a little bit multi-sided during that particular discussion, and he simply said that Falk's credibility came into question. I was bringing up a particular point that I heard from Mike Rodelli, author of In the Shadow of Mount Diablo and The Hunt for Zodiac, whom I've also interviewed on the Zodiac Killer channel, and he criticized Robert Graysmith heavily for not interviewing Officer Falk, someone who may have actually seen the Zodiac Killer and walked away from it and lived to tell the tale. I mean, many people saw the Zodiac when he was committing crimes, but they didn't get to tell the story of what happened. And Rodelli was heavily criticizing Graysmith for not including any type of first-hand comments from Falk in his books on the Zodiac Killer. And Morse said something to the effect of, that's because of Falk's credibility. That speaks of Falk's credibility. He may not have been super truthful. And I really wanted to press him on that, and I was like, well, why don't you think he's truthful? And the response that I got was something to the effect of, I'm not sure, but it just it has to be called into question. And over the past couple of months, I've also gained sort of a greater understanding of Morph's no-nonsense approach, and I can comprehend it in a different way. In the past, I would have been like, no, if you're going to say that somebody lacks credibility, then you definitely need to say why you think that. But... Maybe sometimes you don't always have a reason, or you don't always know what another person is thinking, or you cannot calculate what's going on in their brain, or definitely not what was going on in their brain 50 years ago, but you can recognize that maybe something is missing. I don't trust this person. Well, what do you think their true agenda is? Well, I don't know, but they're definitely coming across as untrustworthy. Yeah, we do experience some things like that. But I would just like to read something that Mike Rodelli has written out on Facebook involving Officer Falk and the sighting of the Zodiac Killer on October 11th of 1969, after the murder of Paul Stein, the final victim. When we spoke to Don Falk years ago, I remember him telling me that Robert Graysmith had never interviewed him either about what he had seen on the night of the Stein murder. And for people who have read Zodiac by Robert Graysmith, which is practically everyone who is interested in the case, you'll know that even famously, Falk's name was misspelled as Falks, with an S at the end, which intentionally or not made it difficult for people to locate him. Falk told us that he had tracked down Robert Graysmith after the book came out and asked him why he was never interviewed. And Graysmith told him not to worry. He was writing a second book, and he would interview him for that one. The book was titled Zodiac Unmasked. And Falk told us Graysmith had never interviewed him for that book either. Officer Falk could not understand why. I think the reason that Graysmith never interviewed the Robbins kids though also those are witnesses, where Falk is simple. His books concluded that Arthur Lee Allen was the Zodiac Killer, and Graysmith had looked at the SFPD wanted poster sketches that he thought were the product of both the kids and Falk's input. Graysmith wasn't stupid. He, like everyone else, could see that they didn't look anything like Arthur Lee Allen until you put the so-called crew-cut wig on him, which people quickly did. Graysmith ended up duping the public by not speaking to those witnesses because he was probably afraid they would say that Allen was not the person they saw that night in or around the cab walking down Jackson Street. And in fact, that's exactly what they did, very emphatically, when they were shown a photograph of Allen years later. In fact, Toski and Armstrong never even showed the Robbins kids a picture of Arthur Lee Allen either. And don't forget that Allen was their prime suspect and the Robbins kids were their eyewitnesses. 
Graysmith is tooted as a pioneer in Zodiac research, and he has a Fincher movie made about him. But in reality, what did he actually do? Something that was selfish. He selfishly set the investigation back by not including information that would have excluded Alan. So much for giving people every scrap of information which he promises to do in his book Zodiac so that this case could be solved. He reached a conclusion about Alan, so why bother to include any information that might upset the apple cart to imply that Alan was not the Zodiac killer? And I responded to Mike Rodelli by talking about that conversation that we had on Planet X Filmworks. And I know I've already shared some of the info, but I would like to read the comment all the same. Last year I appeared on Planet X Filmworks with Ross and Mike Morford, and I brought up the point of Graysmith not interviewing Officer Falk, or Falks, as Graysmith chose to spell it. I told this after you and I did the interview for the expert series on the Zodiac Killer channel. Morf responded to me by saying that Graysmith choosing not to interview Officer Falk speaks more about Falk's credibility, even doubting Falk's testimony. Not sure of the reasons for the motive, but simply stating that Officer Falk's sighting of the Zodiac Killer on October 11th of 1969 should not be trusted. Do you have any response? Mike Rodelli responded to me by saying, That doesn't ring true to me, Ned. I think that Robert Graysmith should have done what I did and spoken to Falk and gauged his credibility based on his own interactions with him. When I spoke to Falk, he seemed like a very sincere and credible person. If you read Zodiac Unmasked, what Graysmith did instead of speaking to him was to create a whole fiction about Falk's interactions with Dave Tosky. In fact, Falk had to set the record straight about what happened and about what was in that book as well as what he did, did during an interview with Fincher. At the same time in Zodiac Unmasked, he let the biggest attention seeker in the case, Pam Farron, go on and on about what she thought. What, what was he worried about his, her credibility? Apparently not. Okay, Mike Rodelli, I follow everything you're saying except maybe Pam Farron. Actually, okay, her name isn't Pam, Fer Pam Farron. She would be Pam Suenen or Pam Huckabee. Darlene Farron was her sister, and she married um, Dean Farron and adopted his name. But yes, Pam changed her name from Suenen to Huckabee, just being clear about that. But I will dispute something even more important, and that is that the biggest attention seeker is not Pam Huckabee. It is Don Shaney. Because you want to talk about putting some stuff in the book Zodiac Unmasked? It is filled with just these little wild stories from Donald Lee Cheney talking about Arthur Lee Allen, and we have no way to corroborate them. And do you ever watch Judge Judy? I haven't seen her show in a couple of years, and I haven't seen that new thing on IMDb, Judy Justice or whatever it's called. But she would do this all the time. She would say, don't tell me what somebody else told you. It's hearsay. It's not evidence. Well, I wish I could go back to the publishing date of Zodiac Unmasked and say, hey, Robert Graysmith, don't tell me what somebody else told you. It's hearsay. It's not evidence. All we have are these little hearsay stories of Don Chaney ratting out Arthur Lee Allen for all of his confessions to being the Zodiac and saying that he wanted slaves in paradise and such. But we have no way to corroborate them. So I just wanted to share some things on both um, both ends of the spectrum about Officer Falk sighting, but he's the guy who provided the description of the five foot ten suspect, which has heavily altered my thinking in the case, and I think that is just something I felt necessary to include. And that goes to say a lot about the suspect's height. To talk about the suspect's age, how old was the Zodiac killer? And if you want to respond to any of these questions, whether it's what is the height or Weight of the Zodiac Killer, how old was the Zodiac Killer, who was the greatest Olympian of all time, summer games or winter games, you can respond in the comments section down below. But we have a comment from Steve Allen who says, The witnesses to the Paul Stein murder describe the Zodiac Killer as being 35 to 45 years old. Suspect McDuff was only 23 at the time of the murders. And yes, McDuff would have been 23 definitely in uh, December of 1968 at the start of the Zodiac crime spree with the Lake Herman Road murders, and, and our next comment comes to us from Professor Stewart, who says, Ned, I've been looking over what Morford has about his suspect, and I'm curious about what you think. What do you think is the most convincing reason to think that Morford has the right guy? All right, to say something positive about McDuff as a Zodiac killer suspect, 
I thought the concept of stressors in his life being a reason to start and stop the crimes was very valuable. It made sense to me, talking about how Macduff got a job in 1971 and there was a halt in Zodiac activity. He got a job with the state of California. I had previously misstated it by saying that it was the Department of Corrections. He did work for the Department of Corrections for some time, but Orf again saying precisely he got a job with the state and he was working with them for the majority of his career, but that's when the letter stopped. There was the halt in Zodiac activity up until 1974, right before Macduff was to get married, and that is again another major stressor in life, a major life event. So you would have somebody committing the crimes in 1968 and 69 fueled by heterosexual animosity, because again, um, if we go back through some of the interviews, I can double check, but I believe that it was reported that Macduff did not have a girlfriend or a lover during any of those times during college, and a lot of people, including others like Michael Cole, talk about how the Zodiac could be fueled by heterosexual animosity, being envious, jealous, and spiteful, of other people who are in conventional heterosexual relationships. These are, these are the reasons for targeting lover slains. The first confirmed Zodiac crimes on December 20th of 1968, the murders of David Faraday and Betty Lutensen. The second was also a lover slain shooting, or a couple was attacked in a car, Mike Majot and Darlene Farron, although Darlene Farron was married to Dean Farron at the time. And then the Lake Berryessa stabbing with Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard. That again, a man and a woman are present, and the only one that differentiates from that is the Stein murder. And then Macduff would maybe had some improvement in his life in 1971, so he felt there was less of a desire or need to create anything in the Zodiac Killer persona. And then by the time you get to 1974, when he is getting married, he writes the Exorcist letter, which says, I saw and think that the Exorcist was the greatest satirical comedy of all time. P.S. If I don't see this note in your paper, I'll do something nasty, which you know I'm capable of. And there's also a section in the middle that talks about plunging into the billowy wave and the suicide's grave, titwillow, 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 which is what some people think could be a suicide note, and not suicide of their own life, not meaning that he is taking his own life, but instead that he is putting an end to the Zodiac Killer persona, because every left letter after 1974 is unconfirmed. I have a lot of suspicions about some of the other letters. The 1978 letter, the 1990 Eureka card, absolutely, I am curious about that, but I am... Uh, that's just my suspicion. I don't believe that they are confirmed Zodiac correspondences or communications at the time. So... I mean, that just made sense to me, but, I mean, we have to wait for the hard physical evidence. We can talk in circles all day long about why we think this or why we think that, or these are the reasons why a Zodiac suspect should be involved. But, anyway, I think that um, you guys could get the idea. So, I'm going to go to the next comment here, which is from Manic Eptipode, that says, Thanks again for the great episode. I hope Mike Morford got the guy, and I will have some updates soon. Oh, excuse me, I says, I hope he will have some updates soon. Since the discussions on his forum got taken down, do you know where, if anywhere, the suspect is being discussed? Now, I haven't seen it myself, but I heard that there was a very lengthy discussion thread on ZodiacKiller.com. Again, that's not ZodiacKiller.net, but ZodiacKiller.com. I would also like to ask a question about something you bring up in the video. Why are you convinced the Zodiac was highly knowledgeable in mathematics? I don't find that he, the, yeah, the fact that he knew a radian very compelling. Oh, it's talking about how the Zodiac wrote in the uh, map code letter that include, or, um, well, anyway, the Zodiac wrote in one of the letters, uh, concerns radians and inches along the radians. And the honest answer is because I was influenced by Gareth Penn and his book Time 17, and as well as The Second Power, talking about how he believed that the Zodiac Killer was highly influenced by in mathematics, or highly knowledgeable of advanced mathematics. And I don't necessarily have the best examples to put forward to you, but that's my honest answer to the question. But the comment continues here by saying, there's no evidence that the Zodiac knew how to apply a radian, 
an angle of 57.3 degrees the way it was suggested, as putting the radiant on Mount Diablo does not line up with the murder sites. Yes, uh, Gareth Penn thought, though, that if you were to put a radiant on top of Mount Diablo, one angle would go to Blue Rock Springs Park and one angle would go to Presidio Heights where Paul Stein was murdered. The Mount, put the radiant on Mount Diablo does not line up with the murder sites, at least according to Michael Butterfield, who I find much more credible than most other theorists, especially Gareth Penn, who seems completely full of shit. <laughs> Sorry. Moreover, it seems clear to me that the Zodiac wanted people to believe that he was much smarter and comp more competent than he was. He clearly wants us to believe that he's some type of invincible criminal mastermind, so it's not surprising that he would try to come off as smart by referencing a concept in mathematics that is obscure to most. Given this, it does not seem to be necessary that an assumption... It doesn't seem to be a necessary assumption that the Zodiac was especially knowledgeable of mathematics. Well, I've discussed this in the comments section with a couple of people, including Richard Grinnell of ZodiacCiphers.com, and he wrote out a very good comment once when he said that, okay, the Zodiac did talk about radians, the angles of 57.3 degrees, or really it's 57.29 and some other numbers, but what he said was, Gareth Penn completely misunderstood the quotation, and he completely misunderstood the instruction, and I even thought for a long time that there was a quote somewhere that said, put a radian on top of Mount Diablo, but instead it says, concerns radians and inches along the radians. It doesn't say anything about the radians are going to have an end point at Blue Rock Springs or Presidio Heights, or the, it doesn't say the radians and the end points of the radians, so Gareth Penn's observation was completely incorrect, and Again, I previously just talked about Michael Cole for a second. He is the author of the Zodiac Revisited Trilogy, and he believes that radians are involved in a different way, that Gareth Penn made a strong observation about how radians could be connected to the mystery in, an, in somewhat of a more important way than other people were giving it credit for, but Gareth Penn was completely wrong about how to, how to apply it, that it concerns radians and inches along the radians, meaning firstly, you need more than one radian, and they need to be arranged as angles on maps and in a way that Gareth Penn didn't even comprehend himself. And the next question from Manic Eptipode in that big comment is, One final thing, can you do an episode on the Zodiac symbol? I've always been confused why people speculate what the symbol means. If there was a watch brand called Zodiac that used the symbol, isn't that clearly it? Why do people speculate about its origin if there's such a definitive answer? Well, one person that would definitely agree with you is, um, is... Drew Beeson, who is the host of the Zodcast and author of the book Sighting In on the Zodiac Killer, he says it, that exact thing, that the Zodiac symbol came from the watch. There's a Zodiac watch that does have that symbol. Now, I was really tempted to do another requested topic soon, talking about the Zodiac Killer satanic connection, because some people think that the Zodiac Killer was not only satanic, but heavily influenced by Aleister Crowley and Anton LaVey, and there are some reasons that I'll get into if I do that episode in the future. And when Geraldo Rivera did that TV special in the 90s talking about the Zodiac Killer, he even suggested that the, the Zodiac symbol is similar to one of the crosses used by Aleister Crowley. Again, I'll save some of that info later on. Some people think it's a Celtic cross. Other people think it's the scope of a gun, like the sight that you would look in through like um, a, a scope that was mounted on top of a rifle. That's definitely something that I thought about when I first learned about the Zodiac Killer being like seven years old or something, watching America's Most Wanted. I didn't know what Zodiac meant, but you were completely right that there is a there is a um, uh, a watch brand called Zodiac, and Tom Void actually replied to Manic Eptipo, providing him with the Tapa Talk group on Zodiac Killer Forum, McDuff Mason. So there are a couple of different places to read info and discussions about Suspect Macduff online. And I said in this episode that I was going to respond to some other topics that were not related to Macduff. And I received a rather extended comment from Brad, the person who asked the first question, again sent to the Facebook page. And what he says here is that, I don't care who the Zodiac ends up being. Maybe just not Richard Gajkowski. 
I just hope that law enforcement will eventually catch him. Great work on your podcast. I listen two to three times a week and just started your book. I'll leave a review soon. On your next book, I want double size font, though. Ah, yes, well, uh, Killer on a White Horse is available on Amazon.com, and I am currently working on the next book. Thank you for reading that, by the way, Brad. Yeah, the next book will be coming out sometime this year, which is going to be some shorts put together. But more importantly, I don't care who the Zodiac ends up being, maybe just not Richard Gajkowski. Even though I've said very clearly that I don't think that Richard Gajkowski was the Zodiac killer, if law enforcement did some way, somehow, say that they had a breakthrough and they identified Geik as the Zodiac, I would accept the result. I wouldn't dispute it. If the FBI signed off and said that law enforcement's right, it was Geik was the Zodiac, I wouldn't dispute it, and I wouldn't feel bad about it at all. I also said that McDuff wasn't the Zodiac killer, and if they said the same thing about him, yes, this was the guy. No, he, he committed these murders back in 1968 and 69. I would say, all right, again, I was wrong. I don't have any real reason to um, hide anything or challenge that or contest the end result. So I don't um, have uh, too much on that one. But Brad's comment continues talking about the Zodiac Killer suspect Gary Francis Post, who was revealed by the Case Breakers in 2021. As for Gary Post, I have a theory, and I totally understand that it's a million to one chance of being correct. I'm sure if it isn't true, I'm sure it isn't true, but there is that one long shot that it could be that the case breakers made a pretty big deal about the scars on Gary Post's forehead. Yes, Gary Post had a scar on his head from a surgery, and the sketch from the Stein crime does show lines on the killer's head. Again, I'm not saying that I believe this, but it was revealed to be the case. I would be shocked. And of course, I ran the idea by a couple other people and said, no way, and they laughed. You know how law enforcement will hide a piece or two of evidence from the public to help weed out fake suspects or confusion? They'll hold something back? Well, what if they're holding back what the witnesses said, that they actually saw scars on the Zodiac's forehead, and that's why the police sketch shows the lines on the forehead? Well, what if that piece of evidence that law enforcement decided to hold back to the general public was just that? Why? It would essentially weed out every suspect that was turned in by the public if that person didn't have a noticeable scar. And you could even say, I think my neighbor is the Zodiac Killer. Law enforcement takes a look at the neighbor and he doesn't have visible scars. Boom, suspect eliminated without a second thought. And imagine the reverse. I think my neighbor might be the Zodiac. Law enforcement takes a look at him and holy cow, he does have noticeable scars on his forehead. And just going down the conspiracy side, but remember, a sketch was released from the kids' description. A month later, the sketch was revised from the reported Falk Sums edition. That's why um, that's why Morfra does dispute the Falk sighting, because he thinks that there's some type of reason why that was delayed too long. But the Falk Sums edition, do you see the difference in the two sketches? The updated one has way less lines on the forehead. If law enforcement was keeping... The scars are secret, and removing them from a revised sketch, then that would make sense. Again, 99.99% chance this is just a crazy conspiracy, but who knows? Well, one person who might have a better understanding of this would be Mike Rodelli, as you heard from the comment that he wrote, that which I read off on this episode. He says that he has interviewed all of the witnesses that were just cited by Brad there, the Robbins kids, and Officer Falk, and they didn't report anything to him about scars on the forehead. I've also talked to Mike Rodelli about this via email after Gary Post was brought forward as a Zodiac killer suspect. And I'm not saying that you're wrong, Brad. No, not at all. It's just it that particular piece of information did not come up. And my stance on that one has been that the case breakers have misunderstood something. They think that the lines on the forehead of the composite sketches are scars when I simply thought that they were just details that were made to, it was meant to show the age of the suspect. And our next comment comes to us on the episode, Did the Zodiac Killer Murder Sherry Jo Bates? By Will Vixgar, who says, When you, you look into this case, the more and more you realize that Sherry Jo Bates was definitely a Zodiac Killer victim. Sherry Jo Bates was murdered on October 30th of 1966 by somebody outside of the RCC library, that's Riverside City College, and the Zodiac Killer loosely 
took credit for a crime in the area, saying, You stumbled upon my riverside work, not mentioning her by name or doing the famous I'll state some facts that only I and the police know. On the one hand, I do agree with you, Will, that the more you look into the case, the more I can comprehend why people say that Sherry Jo Bates was a victim of the Zodiac Killer. But instead, I have to go with my original instincts that she was murdered very viciously. The Zodiac, or I shouldn't say the Zodiac, I just said I thought he didn't do it. The perpetrator was very confrontational with Sherry Jo Bates and was practically fighting her face to face. The Zodiac didn't do that with the other victims. And also, the, the, she was murdered by knife, and the first victims in Lake Herman Road were shot with a gun. It wasn't until Lake Berryessa, the third canonical crime, that the Zodiac attacked the victims by knife. And furthermore, the biggest piece of evidence, in my opinion, turned out to be from someone who was identified and turned out not to be the Zodiac killer, ruled out by law enforcement. In 2016, someone wrote a confession letter saying that he wrote the base had to die letters that were signed with a Z. I, that was the biggest piece of evidence that I just couldn't shake, that I couldn't get rid of. You might even say it was making me twitch and squirm. I was like, I don't think the Zodiac murdered Sherry Jo Bates, but there were these three letters that said Bates had to die, there will be more. The third one actually says she had to die, there will be more. And they were signed with what appeared to be a Z. But in 2016, someone admitted to writing them nearly 50 years ago. It would have been, yeah, just about that. 49 years ago at the time of his confession and he said i wrote those as a teenager it was a prank it was a sick joke i was a troubled teen i, I made a mistake and law enforcement looked into him and they said that they ruled him out as both being the murderer of sherry joe bates and the zodiac killer meaning yes indeed it was a prank and to 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 everyone um well dismay i suppose or i don't think anyone would be super surprised because it doesn't contain any specific information. It just says her name, Bates. But it doesn't say how she was murdered. It doesn't say any specific details. She was wearing this color of socks. She was this many meters from the library. Or what the Zodiac would do later on in the future, saying her feet were facing the west. Her feet were facing the car door, like he did responding to the Lake Herman Road murders. That type of information is not present. And that would have happened only several, several months after the murder of Sherry Jo Bates, not like two years or anything. And the Zodiac recalled that information about David Ferdy and Betty Lou Jensen seven months after the Lake Herman Road shooting that he would put into the first letter. So I don't believe that the Zodiac murdered Sherry Jo Bates, but I definitely comprehend the reasons why people think so, which I've stated in other episodes. Our next comment is on the episode Zodiac, Don Cheney, AMA, and it is from Johnny Gizmo, who says, Cheney was initially the start of the killings and letters. He blackmailed Arthur Lee Allen into helping him. Don Cheney probably found out Allen was molesting and drugging two brothers and their sister, who often, whom he often babysat. Their father was in jail, and the mother trusted Alan to no end. Alan liked the attention that came from being a suspect, as he had that type of personality that liked attention. Alan allegedly confessed to one of the boys of being the Zodiac just weeks before he died in 1992. And the children, I believe you're talking about, are the Seawaters, and especially uh, Connie and... Uh, Dave Seawater have revealed a lot of information recently on their YouTube channel talking about how Arthur Lee Allen confessed before he died of not only molesting him, which isn't a ridiculous accusation, and I'm so sorry to hear about that, but the more um, more criminal accusation of being the Zodiac killer. I can't really um, confirm or deny their story, but I would like to respond to the first part of this comment here. Don Cheney initially started the killings and letters, and then he blackmailed Alan into helping him. Well, there's your partnership theory, and so many people have talked about this. I even talked about this, not even saying Don Cheney, but just talking about this in my first episode, Arthur Lee Allen's partner. Just asking that question, what if Arthur Lee Allen had a partner, which would account for all of the discrepancies in the case, but also all the reasons why people suspected Arthur Lee Allen. I mean, I've definitely thought about it, you've thought about it, we've all thought about it. That would explain some things like Arthur Lee Allen, why Arthur Lee Allen would assist with dropping letters in a mailbox and such. I, I mean, I just don't really know that. It's just something that I thought about in the past, but um, I guess we'll have to leave it at that. Here's a question, though, from last week's AMA on 
Gary Francis Post, and it is a two-part question. Could you address the Delphi murders in Gary Post? Could Gary Post have committed the Delphi murders before his death? I know it sounds crazy, but could it be a link? I'm going to say no, because no, I don't know Gary Post's exact weight in 1968 and 69, and he is a Zodiac killer suspect. But Gary Post was arrested in his later years, I believe when he was 78 years old, and he only weighed 175 pounds. He was 6 feet tall and 175 pounds. The person in the Delphi video, the bridge guy, is much larger. He is very wide around the waist, and Gary Post was probably a pretty skinny guy at 6 feet tall, 175 pounds, and I think that he is too old and too thin to have been the bridge guy from the Delphi murders. And you heard my response to the murder of Sherry Jo Bates, but Daniel Webster has a comment that also came in on a recent episode, but talking about the murder of Sherry Jo Bates as well. Sherry Jo Bates was killed by someone who had a mental and emotional attachment to her. In other words, it was a crime of passion, which was why she was nearly beheaded. Now they chased an innocent man for 53 years, and when they finally got his DNA, he was innocent. But it would be someone like him, certainly not the Zodiac. I don't know, but certainly I believe that somebody killed Sherry Jo Bates. Strange this is going to sound, but I think he both loved her and hated her. Strange as that sounds, huh? Yeah, that's a little bit strange, but also, I get what you're saying. That's someone who had a personal connection, as opposed to someone who was just hunting people for sport in the way that the other victims were gunned down. All right, and everybody, thank you for listening to this Zodiac Killer AMA Ask Me Anything. Started out by talking about Suspect McDuff and then went on to discuss everything under the sun and in the darkness about the Zodiac Killer as well as some of the unconfirmed crimes, particularly the murder of Sherry Jo Bates. I would love to read your comments in the section down below. What do you think about Suspect McDuff? And if you would like to create your own profile of the Zodiac Killer, I would also love to read that. I told you about some of my observations in the past. I have a whole episode on it, but I said that I thought the Zodiac was between five, oh, five foot eight and six feet tall, particularly five foot ten and a half if I had to put a number on it, whereas when I looked at the age of the Zodiac, I thought that he would have been early 30s to early 40s. I know that's not very precise, but also I said he would have been 210 pounds. What do you think about that? But, um... Another reason why the Zodiac Killer could be um, in his early 30s is, as somebody who's in his early 30s now, I'm 5 feet 8 inches tall. I just got weighed at the uh, doctor's office the other day, and I weigh 191 pounds. When I was 23, I dropped down to 140. I was a little bit bigger, and then some things like Slim Fast entered my life, and I went down to 140 pounds. I'll tell you, the older you get, the bigger your waist get, especially when you eat junk all day like I do. So, I don't know. I mean, that could be nothing. Not everyone who is is going to gain weight just like that. Some people lose weight, and according to Mike Morford, that his suspect, Macduff, was 200 pounds at age 23. I'm fully aware that it's possible. I just wanted to point out that it's very normal for people to gain weight and get heavier as they get older. Is that going to stop me from eating junk? No. Why? Because I'm on this new diet. It's called I eat whatever I want, and I just kind of get fat, and that's the end of it. But um, I'm really going to regret this 10 years from now, but I don't mind. Anyway, please ask any questions that you want, but maybe they'll be used in a future AMA. Are there any suspects that you would like to hear about for a future AMA? And I'm really liking the flow of these because I cannot talk about the suspects, but I can also respond to your questions all at once. And then on True Crime Talk Radio, we can talk about some other things, as well as on the uh, regular AMA, which will come out on Wednesday. I would love to read any comments that you guys have. Anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box, blackboxned88 on Instagram, and of course, amazon.com, where you can find the book Killer on a White Horse by me, Ned DeHaan, the Teespring page for some of the merchandise, Astro Psych 400 for the podcast for sleep. And that's all for me now, so I will see you over on Instagram for the bonus podcast. Until next time.